Simple Cyber Defense Security Updates for March 17th, 2022. Welcome back to the Simple Cyber Defense. In this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, legislation and laws that are related to data privacies. Uh, so this may not be the most interesting topic, but it is important to understand the laws that govern data privacy and data protection, because the biggest part of cybersecurity is keeping your data secure. And in order to do that fully, you'd have to understand the laws and actually have politicians who are going to place intelligent laws to be able to help us. So we're going to dive into the laws that are current and upcoming so that we can get a better idea of what the government is doing to protect our data online. So my name is Carl. Hi, this is Ahmad. And so let's begin. So you want to get started with your part of it? Yeah, so um, as you just as you mentioned, you know this is not the the uh, the most interesting topic. However, it's very important. Um, here on on this channel, we've always been talking about what can I do as a consumer to protect myself, right? Uh, what can I do? What how much can I learn? What steps can I take to secure my data and and uh, my my digital assets, right? Uh, and we still, you know, almost on a weekly basis, we'll hear about a breach that happened at, you know, whether it's a, a mobile phone company, it's a gaming company, it's a financial company. And we know, you know, as, a, as consumers, we've done our best to protect our data. However, um, whoever is in charge of that data was still hacked. There was still an incident, there was still a breach, and my information was accessed by somebody who uh, was not supposed to access my information. So to, to combat that, back in the 70s, the United States passed a few laws, they call, let's call them computer crime laws, right, which, are, which were to, to protect information systems from, from being access illegally or to be from being used to perform illegal activity it was very broad uh, in general and it didn't really talk about consumer rights and and you know private information and and uh, uh personal information etc and believe it or not to this day in the united states there is not a law that is on a federal level that is all encompassing to protect consumer data. There are uh, special laws, for example, your uh, health data, for example, and you, you will talk about that uh, in a few minutes, um, but there isn't something that's all encompassing the United States. States are on the state level, there are regulations. Like for example, in California, the, which is the most strict state when it comes to um, you know, companies having your personal information, using your personal information for financial gain, uh, or e not even for financial gain, just for data processing and understanding behaviors and creating algorithms. Um, and for example, there is even even uh, tracking cookies on your on your browsers, right? Um, things like that. Uh, but Europe is a lot years ahead of us, right? Because the European Union has it put in place um, what they call the uh, GDPR, the General Data uh, Protection Regulation, and this is for all countries in the European Union. And what that does, it is pretty much a, a framework. It, it sets guidelines from from the inception of the consumer providing the data. So that framework covers everything from the moment you provide the data to how they use the data 
to how you as the owner of the data can modify or can request it to be removed or can request it to be how, how it is used. Um, and it's, you know, and also the collection and the processing of the information, right? And it doesn't matter where the website is based. It applies to all individuals who live in the EU, right? And any website that attracts European visitors, even if they're not in that market, they have to abide by those rules, right? And, and this in itself is, is, is light years ahead of us here in the United States, right? Um, in addition to that, you know, there, the um, visitors of uh, visitors to any website must be notified of data that is collected from them during their visit, and they have to consent to the information being gathered. Right? They have to click on yes on an I agree button. They have to, um, you know, confirm how it is used. Um, and also on top of that, any website or any organization that uses that information or collects that information, they must notify the person whose data has been breached within a set time limit, right? Even if that data has not been used maliciously, just the fact that it has been breached and somebody may have just looked at your data, you have to be notified by law. Um, it is also the, the only regulation that has a dedicated, what's called a, a DPO, which is a data protection officer. Um, and that, that, that it's, it, it's an actual full-time hired position for a person to carry out this function, right? Um, and also how, as a consumer, can you contact the DPO and other uh, relevant, uh, you know, functions have to be accessible to somebody who visits a website if they are living within the, the EU. Um, it also, like, the, as far as collecting the data, it has to be anonymized, right? You can't just, for example, you can't collect data in, in plain text, right? It has to be protected. So it, it, it pretty much, the framework just sets guidelines for every, every step of the way and every step of the, you know, uh, every piece of information that's being given or, or, or communicated. At the same time, it gives you specific guidelines on what you have to do um, if the information is breached. Or it tells you, also gives you guidelines on what you need to do as a data controller or a data owner if, uh, on how that your data can be used, right? Now, it's not, you know, it, it's not a perfect system, right? Nothing in, in, in perfect, it, it is perfect, right? But um, at, at the same time, you know, it's it's a step in the right direction, right? It's something that we need here in the US on a federal level, right? Um, so do you have anything to, to, to add to that? Um, no, not really. I guess so, what they say I, is some security is better than none. So, right, right. <laughs> uh, so, what's similar to that here in the U.S. is when it comes to health information, right? Which is uh, yeah. HIPAA regulation, and uh, HIPAA is pretty much it, it deals with hospitals or any organizations that deal with a consumer's health information, and you, you have some information on that. Yeah, so the uh, first round of HIPAA started around in 1999, and basically, like you were saying, it's designed to protect people's health information. So the HIPAA stands for the Health Ins Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So any kind of health data that's being collected from hospitals, doctor's office, dentists, any anything like that, would have to be required by law to put certain uh, safeguards in your health data. Like they couldn't hold your uh, 
medical records in an open server where anyone can access it. It has to be controlled so that only certain people have access to it. And then if the data is stored somewhere more in a more permanent status, it has to be encrypted and not allowed anyone access to it. Again, it has to be specific reasons for those records to be accessed so that not anyone can just go out, can I see Joe Blow's medical record? Well, you're not a doctor, you're not anything, so you don't have access to it, which is good. And another thing on top of that is they can only hold your medical records up to seven years without any activity before they have to delete it. So not only do they have to protect it, but they can only store it for seven years. And if they haven't accessed or used that medical record within that seven years, they have to delete it. Again, that's a way to prevent what's called uh, uh, basically data hoarding. And there's many companies out there that will hoard a lot of data in their databases and have no intentions of ever using it. And then they get breached and then all sorts of history gets exposed. So this is a way to kind of prevent that from happening. So on top of all this, another thing that they put in place with HIPAA is allowing people who believe that their personal health information has been improperly handled. And they have a notification rule that the providers have to give to the user if a data breach has happened or if any record has been mishandled anywhere. And if they don't do this, they could get into serious fines and probably close down their practice. And it is very important to know how to report these potential uh, breaches that happen. I'll put sh uh, links in the show notes to places where you can go to report any hospital or medical malpractice that you think is uh, mishandling your data, and they will investigate and see if their if your data was mishandled or not. And if it has been, they'll deal with it and and then go from there to protect in the future or shut down the place if they're not going to. Um, so do you have anything else you want to add into the HIPAA? Uh, well, you know, just like you said, you know, it's it was put in place to protect all this patient information. Also, you know, it applies not just to hospitals, because we think HIPAA is oh, just hospital. No, it's anyone who has access to your health information. Yeah, like I said, doctor's so, office, dentist. Doctor's office, any, they're vendors. So let's say, for example, you have, you go to the dentist, right? Mm -hmm. And your dentist gets uh, their supplies from a vendor and that vendor has what's called a, uh, they have what's called a vendor managed system where they, they refill their supplies of, I don't know, the, the numbing agent they put on your teeth. If they get that information, or even if they have access to that information, even if they don't see it, but if there is open access, there is a, a digital connection between these two locations, all these vendors have to apply and abide by HIPAA, HIPAA rules. Um, the same thing with pharmacies and the pharmacy, any, anything, yeah. right? Uh, which, which is, which, and any uh, like medical billing, right? So, mm -hmm. um, also the same thing, even though they, they may not be doing actual medical work, but they have information. Yes, this person was at this location and they made payment with this card, which is a good segue to take us to the next point we want to talk about, which uh, the, the payment card industry uh, data security standard, right? Now, this is not a law, right? It's a standard, right? Yeah. Which means it, it's an industry standard. Right, it's not mandated by law, but it's required by Visa and Mastercard and you know the, all the big credit card co banks and companies. It's kind of like you have to to pay to play, right? If if you don't abide by the PCI DSS, then you cannot accept credit cards, right? And if you cannot accept mm -hmm. credit cards, 
then you really can't do any business, right? Uh, and it's, if you look, you know, th this is looking at our capitalistic society, right? That the first thing we want to tackle is things that have to, to deal with our, with money, right? Financials, right? Yeah. Which is fine. It's a good start, but still. Um, and it was introduced in 2006, but it, it's always evolving, right? As the technology evolves, it evolves with it, right? And pretty much it focuses on improving the payment account security through the transaction process, right? It's, uh, it's administered by the uh, uh, Payment Card Industry Standards uh, Organization, which is, it's an independent body, independent body, uh, but it was created by the major payment card brands, like, you know, Visa, Air MasterCard, and Discover, American Express, et cetera. Um, and they're also responsible for uh, enforcing compliance, right? Um, uh, no, no, sorry. It, the payment, the banks are responsible for enforcing compliance, not the PCI yeah. accounts, right? Which shows you, yeah, it's independent, but really how independent is it, right? Um, and also the uh, uh, PCI DSS applies to any organization, regardless of size or number of transactions that accept or transmit or store credit card data, right? Uh, so you can say, well, and this is, showing you the evolution. Well, now I can accept credit cards as on my phone, right? And I'm not on, I'm not on organizations. Does that apply to me? And you'll see there is, okay, what if I'm an organization, but a person who is an employee or an officer of the organization accepts payment payments as an individual. And then on behalf of the organization, do, do those, rule, those rules apply to them, right? So it, it, there's a lot of loopholes in it, but it's, it's growing and it's, it's uh, evolving. Um, and to, to kind of, to, to kind of help with that, that, you know, the, uh, there's like different categories that they put merchants in, right. And those are based on the number of transactions over 12 months. Right. And if, if anyone is interested in knowing the different, the different merchant levels, uh, they're on the, the website um, and you know, how many transactions, how much per transaction, how much is the total transactions. And then they break it down four categories. And then each of those categories have certain rules that they need to, to abide by. However, the major rules, you know, the rules security, the, secu the physical security of the machines that perform the transactions, the digital security, uh, between uh, the connection between the actual uh, terminal and the bank, and then on the other side between the bank and the processing company, all that is managed. And anyone that accepts credit cards, and I know, you know, if you're a business owner and you're listening to this, you probably remember signing a 20 or 30 page agreement with your credit card processing company. That is all in there. However, nobody reads those things, right? Not that many people read those, those things, right? Um, so th there are certain requirements that they need to be, uh, they need to be met. And, you know, if we talk about that level four requirements, which are for like small merchants, small or middle-sized businesses, uh, there is a, there's, you know, questionnaires that you have to, and self-assessments that you have to do. Uh, there is, uh, you know, there is instructions, right? And, and all that stuff, like I said, it is a standard. It's, it's not enforceable by law, but imagine you get audited by Visa one day and all of a sudden, okay, you, know, you can't accept credit cards anymore for a week. There goes a week of, of revenue. What would that do to, you know, somebody who has a small business that they, they pretty much rely on every dollar that's coming into that business, right? Um, another is, you know, let's say, okay, well, I take, I take credit card orders over the phone. You know, I have a ghost kitchen or something along those lines. Yes, you have to abide. There are rules for that. And you have to know what these rules are and just to protect yourself. Right. Um, and unlike regulations that are there, that put there, that are put there to protect the consumer, these standards are put there to protect the companies. Right. So as a, as a user, or you have to to know what you need to what you need to do, and also to, to kind of 
you can guarantee a better service to your customers, right? Um, well, let's say, what if I use a third party processor? Do I have to comply? Yes, you have to comply. If there's a third party processor, you are still part of that network and there are certain compliance steps that you need to take. Um, whether it's, you know, single location, multiple location, uh, multiple locations, e-commerce, all that. If you accept credit cards, you have to abide by those. You have to meet those standards, right? Um, now, Do they, do they apply to debit cards? If it has a logo on it, then you have to abide by those rules. You'll see also see, you know, uh, small, small businesses, you know, little strip malls, oh, cash or debit only. Well, that's, you can't just by doing that, say, no, I don't take credit cards. I take only debit cards. It does not relieve you from meeting those standards, right? Um, and it, it if you are a larger company and you store actual payment card data on site or you store it in a server or you store it in a paper format, there are you know, certain regulations that you have to follow as well as standards to protect and secure that data behind uh, two locked uh, devices. So it can be, uh, I can have it, you know, if I store it all in a hard drive, the hard drive can have a password and, and then, or can be encrypted. And then the hard drive can be inside a filing cabinet that I lock, right? So th these are two levels of, you know, lock. So things like that. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, there, there's many, there's many different types of standards, right? We, here on this episode, we talked about, you know, health stuff. We talked about uh, we talked, you know, HIPAA, we talked about GDPR and we're talking about payment cards, but there's stuff for everything out there, right? So everybody that is in an in industry, they know what they need to follow, do your research to protect yourself and protect your consumer. Um, and, you know, also the, it's not just that, it's also location where you are. Like, for example, here in California, we have certain regulations that are not anywhere else. And Carl, you have uh, you have some news about what's going on in Utah yeah. um, that that you wanna that you wanna bring that you wanna bring up. All right, yeah, uh, Utah and uh, Washington State. So apparently, uh, so many laws are being uh, discussed and about being created to protect people's uh, privacy and data and security and all this, and the. Uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation is one large organization that has been lobbying many of these states to pass similar laws to the California and the GDPR. Uh, there are two states in particular that the EFS says that even though they are in the process of making laws, but the laws they have are just way too weak. And the first state is the Washington state. Um, so they were just saying that a lot of their laws are not similar at all to the California Protection Act, and it still gives companies a lot of wiggle room to not be as private as the GDPR and the Electra or the uh, California laws. And the EFF is pushing them to say, okay, let's try to make this a lot better. Let's look at California as the example of what we should be doing. And hopefully they will listen to them. Um, the same goes with Utah. They're urging the governor to veto the privacy, the data privacy bill that's in, that's uh, being suggested because they're saying it's, not strong at all and it's just complete garbage is what they're saying um let's see it says that this bill also fails on some of eff's highest priorities for effective and protective privacy legislation the utah bill expressively permits companies to charge charge people more or give them the lesser service if they if they ask a company not to sell their information. This makes privacy a luxury for only those that can afford it. 
It also lacks a privacy right of action, an individual right to sue, which is standard in many federal and state privacy laws. Even worse, it gives businesses a right to cure before any government enforcement. That gives businesses a get-out-of-jail-free card to violate the law, secure in the knowledge that they cannot be punished for their privacy invasions that precede government requests that they stop. In short, this bill does not or does nothing to incentivize companies to respect individual privacies. So, like I said, it it's just very weak and it in the EFS word, it doesn't really do anything to protect the privacy laws. So hopefully the EFF can continue pushing these states to get more privacy laws that are similar to the California state law. And it's a good thing that the EFF is actually fighting for us. Um, Because if it wasn't for them, I don't think anyone would be pushing these legislations to say, hey, how about we try to be better instead of trying to just give these businesses the same old treatment that they can do whatever they want to our data and have absolutely no uh, punishment for any violations. So is there anything else you want to add to that? No, that's uh, that's pretty much, you know, the direction yeah. that we're, we're going and you know, one of the things that, you know, we we always talk about is, you know, any regulation is better than no regulation, right? And that's, that's the direction that we're going in. And I hope, you know, for for better regulation and, you know, and, and, and across the board for, for yeah. everybody. And I hope that it happens on the federal level. Yeah. And if you want to get involved, I urge to look at the EFF and see how you can contribute to them or call up your local senator or statesman and say, hey, we really need to get these uh, data privacy laws passed so that we can get protected, so that we're not out there being taken advantage of or have the companies do whatever they want with our data. Because if we can't control the the storage of our data and it gets out of hand and you know, right now there's so many data breaches out there that a lot of our personal data is out there out in the internet for anyone to grab. And that's kind of scary. So we need to make sure that we can get better laws in place to prevent more of these standard data breaches. Because today, if a data breach happens, all the company has to do is like, oh, sorry, your data was exposed. Uh, we promise to do better and then just go on to do the same old, same old and get breached over and over again. So hopefully more laws will be passed to make everything more private. Now, while we're on this topic, you are planning on having a, a guest on our show to actually talk more about this and he's more on the legal side of things? Correct. So I have a friend who is a lawyer who specializes in data privacy laws and what we can do to hold many of these companies liable for any negligence that they've done, whether it's HIPAA violations or just uh, credit card information being exposed or whatever it is. So hopefully in the next episode we can get him on to an interview and we can sit down and discuss these things so that everyone can have a better idea of what they can do to after a breach happens so that they can protect themselves so that you know they're not faced with many different identity theft claims that they can't defend themselves against or if they don't know what to do, if they suspect their doctor is not protecting their health data and all that. So is there anything else you want to add before we close? Nope. That should do it. All right. So with that said, we hope to see you in the next episode where we will have a 
Aaron Asen, the lawyer, on with our interview with them. And so, sorry that we weren't here for two weeks. We both had uh, some sicknesses that are not COVID related, but <laughs> we're all good now. So hopefully we can hit the ground running and continue giving you information to keep you safe online. So hopefully see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Simple Cyber Defense Security Updates. Join us next time when we dive into more security issues and make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you have a topic suggestion or want to support the podcast, stop by our website at simplecyberdefense.com.